Christopher Columbus was an Italian explorer, navigator, colonizer, and citizen of the Republic of Genoa. Under the auspices of the Catholic monarchs of Spain, he completed four voyages across the Atlantic Ocean. Those voyages, and his efforts to establish permanent settlements on the island of Hispaniola, initiated the Spanish colonization of the New World. In the context of emerging Western imperialism and economic competition between European kingdoms through the establishment of trade routes and colonies, Columbus's proposal to reach the East Indies by sailing westward eventually received the support of the Spanish crown, which saw in it a chance to enter the spice trade with Asia through a new westward route. During his first voyage in 1492, instead of arriving at Japan as he had intended, Columbus reached the New World, landing on an island in the Bahamas archipelago that he named San Salvador. Over the course of three more voyages, Columbus visited the Greater and Lesser Antilles as well as the Caribbean coast of Venezuela and Central America, claiming all of it for the crown of Castile. Though Columbus was not the first European explorer to reach the Americas, his voyages led to the first lasting European contact with the Americas, inaugurating a period of European exploration, conquest, and colonization that lasted for several centuries. These voyages had, therefore, an enormous impact in the historical development of the modern Western world. Columbus spearheaded the transatlantic slave trade and has been accused by several historians of initiating the genocide of the Hispaniola natives. Columbus himself saw his accomplishments primarily in the light of spreading the Christian religion, never admitting that he had reached a continent previously unknown to Europeans rather than the East Indies he had set out for. Columbus called the inhabitants of the lands he visited Indios. Columbus's strained relationship with the Spanish crown and its appointed colonial administrators in America led to his arrest and dismissal as governor of the settlements on the island of Hispaniola in 1500 and later to protracted litigation over the benefits which Columbus and his heirs claimed were owed to them by the crown. Early life. The name Christopher Columbus is the anglicization of the Latin Christophorus Columbus. His name in Italian is Cristoforo Colombo, and in Spanish, it is Cristobal Colon. Columbus was born before 31 October 1451 in the territory of the Republic of Genoa, though the exact location remains disputed. His father was Domenico Colombo, a middle-class wool weaver who worked both in Genoa and Savona and who also owned a cheese stand at which young Christopher worked as a helper. Christopher's mother was Susanna Fontanarossa. Bartolomeo, Giovanni Pellegrino, and Giacomo were his brothers. Bartolomeo worked in a cartography workshop in Lisbon for at least part of his adulthood. He also had a sister named Bianchi Netta. Columbus never wrote in his native language, which is presumed to have been a genos a variety of Ligurian. In one of his writings, Columbus claims to have gone to sea at the age of 10. In 1470, the Columbus family moved to Savona, where Domenico took over a tavern. In the same year, Columbus was on a Genoza ship hired in the service of René of Anjou to support his attempt to conquer the Kingdom of Naples. Some modern historians have argued that Columbus was not from Genoa, but instead from the Aragon region of Spain or from Portugal. These competing hypotheses have generally been discounted by mainstream scholars. In 1473, Columbus began his apprenticeship as business agent for the important centurion, Di Negro and Spinola families of Genoa. Later, he allegedly made a trip to Chios, an Aegean island then ruled by Genoa. In May 1476, he took part in an armed convoy sent by Genoa to carry a valuable cargo to northern Europe. He docked in Bristol, England and Galway, Ireland. In 1477, he was possibly in Iceland. In the autumn of 1477, Columbus sailed on a Portuguese ship from Galway to Lisbon, where he found his brother Bartolomeo, and they continued trading for the Centurion family. 
Columbus based himself in Lisbon from 1477 to 1485. He married Philippa Monas Perestrello, daughter of the Porto Santo governor and Portuguese nobleman of Lombard origin Bartolomeu Perestrello. In 1479 or 1480, his son Diego Columbus was born. Between 1482 and 1485, Columbus traded along the coasts of West Africa, reaching the Portuguese trading post of Elmina at the Guinea coast. Some records report that Philippa died in 1485. It is also speculated that Columbus may have simply left his first wife. In either case, Columbus left Portugal for Castile in 1485, where he found a mistress in 1487, a 20-year-old orphan named Beatriz Enriquez de Aranha. Ambitious, Columbus eventually learned Latin, Portuguese, and Castilian and read widely about astronomy, geography, and history including the works of Claudius Ptolemy, Cardinal Pierre Dalis Amago Mundi, the travels of Marco Polo and Sir John Mandeville, Pliny's Natural History, and Pope Pius II's Historia Rerum Ubic Gesturum. According to historian Edmund Morgan, Columbus was not a scholarly man, yet he studied these books made hundreds of marginal notations in them and came out with ideas about the world that were characteristically simple and strong and sometimes wrong. Throughout his life, Columbus also showed a keen interest in the Bible and in biblical prophecies, and would often quote biblical texts in his letters and logs. For example, part of the argument that he submitted to the Spanish Catholic monarchs when he sought their support for his proposed expedition to reach the Indies, by sailing west was based on his reading of the second book of E.S.D. Ras. Towards the end of his life, Columbus produced a book of prophecies, in which his career as an explorer is interpreted in the light of Christian eschatology and of apocalypticism, based on his writings. Author Carol Delaney believes Columbus was hoping to obtain gold from Asia in order to finance a crusade to retake Jerusalem for Christendom before the end of the world. Quest for Asia Background under the Mongol Empire's hegemony over Asia, Europeans had long enjoyed a safe land passage, the Silk Road to India and China, which were sources of valuable goods such as spices and silk. With the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453, the land route to Asia became much more difficult and dangerous. Portuguese navigators tried to find a seaway to Asia. In 1470 the Florentine astronomer Paolo dal Pozzo Toscanelli suggested to King Afonso V of Portugal that sailing west would be a quicker way to reach the Spice Islands. Cathay and C.I. Pungu than the route round Africa. Afonso rejected his proposal. Portuguese explorers, under the leadership of King John II, then developed a passage to Asia by sailing around Africa. Major progress in this quest was achieved in 1488, when Bartolomeu Diaz reached the Cape of Good Hope in what is now South Africa. Meanwhile, in the 1480s, the Columbus brothers had picked up Toscanelli's suggestion and proposed a plan to reach the Indies by sailing west across the Ocean Sea, e. the Atlantic. However, Dias's discovery had shifted the interests of Portuguese seafaring to the Southeast Passage, which complicated Columbus's proposals significantly. Geographical Considerations Washington Irving's 1828 biography of Columbus popularized the idea that Columbus had difficulty obtaining support for his plan because many Catholic theologians insisted that the earth was flat. In fact, most educated Westerners had understood that the earth was spherical at least since the time of Aristotle, who lived in the 4th century BC and whose works were widely studied and revered in medieval Europe. The sphericity of the earth is also accounted for in the work of Ptolemy, on which medieval astronomy was largely based. 
Christian writers whose works clearly reflect the conviction that the earth is spherical include Saint Bede the Venerable in his Reckoning of Time, written around AD 723. In Columbus's time, the techniques of celestial navigation, which use the position of the sun and the stars in the sky, together with the understanding that the Earth is a sphere, had long been in use by astronomers and were beginning to be implemented by mariners. As far back as the 3rd century BC, Eratosthenes had correctly computed the circumference of the Earth by using simple geometry and studying the shadows cast by objects at two different locations, Alexandria and Syene. Eratosthenes's results were confirmed by a comparison of stellar observations at Alexandria and Rhodes, carried out by Posidonius in the 1st century BC. These measurements were widely known among scholars, but confusion about the old-fashioned units of distance in which they were expressed had led, in Columbus's day, to some debate about the exact size of the Earth. From Dali's Amago Mundi Columbus learned of Alfraganus's estimate that a degree of latitude spanned 56 and two-thirds miles but did not realize that this was expressed in the Arabic mile rather than the shorter Roman mile with which he was familiar. He therefore estimated the circumference of the Earth to be about 30,200 kilometers, whereas the correct value is 40,000 kilometers. Furthermore, most scholars accepted Ptolemy's estimate that Eurasia spanned 180 degrees longitude, rather than the actual 130 degrees or 150 degrees. Columbus, for his part, believed the even higher estimate of Marinus of Tyre, which put the longitudinal span of the Eurasian landmass at 225 degrees, leaving only 135 degrees of water. He also believed that Japan was much larger, farther to the east from China, and closer to the equator than it is and that there were inhabited islands even farther to the east than Japan, including the mythical Antilia, which he thought might lie not much farther to the west than the Azores. In this, he was influenced by the ideas of Florentine astronomer Toscanelli, who corresponded with Columbus before his death in 1482 and who also defended the feasibility of a westward route to Asia. Columbus therefore estimated the distance from the Canary Islands to Japan to be about 3,000 Italian miles. The true figure is now known to be vastly larger, about 12,500 kilometers. No ship in the 15th century could have carried enough food and fresh water for such a long voyage, and the dangers involved in navigating through the uncharted ocean would have been formidable. Most European navigators reasonably concluded that a westward voyage from Europe to Asia was unfeasible. The Catholic monarchs, however, having completed an expensive war in the Iberian Peninsula, were eager to obtain a competitive edge over other European countries in the quest for trade with the Indies. Columbus's project, though far-fetched, held the promise of such an advantage. Nautical considerations though Columbus was wrong about the number of degrees of longitude that separated Europe from the Far East and about the distance that each degree represented. He did possess valuable knowledge about the trade winds, which would prove to be the key to his successful navigation of the Atlantic Ocean. During his first voyage in 1492, the brisk trade winds from the east, commonly called easterlies, propelled Columbus's fleet for five weeks, from the Canary Islands to the Bahamas. The precise first land sighting and landing point was San Salvador Island. To return to Spain against this prevailing wind would have required several months of an arduous sailing technique, called beating during which food and drinkable water would probably have been exhausted. Instead, Columbus returned home by following the curving trade winds northeastward to the middle latitudes of the North Atlantic, where he was able to catch the westerlies that blow eastward to the coast of Western Europe. There, in turn, the winds curve southward towards the Iberian Peninsula. It is unclear whether Columbus learned about the winds from his own sailing experience or if he had heard about them from others. 
The corresponding technique for efficient travel in the Atlantic appears to have been exploited first by the Portuguese, who referred to it as the Volta do Mar. Columbus's knowledge of the Atlantic wind patterns was, however, imperfect at the time of his first voyage. By sailing directly due west from the Canary Islands during hurricane season, skirting the so-called horse latitudes of the mid-Atlantic, Columbus risked either being becalmed or running into a tropical cyclone, both of which he luckily avoided. Quest for financial support for a voyage in 1485, Columbus presented his plans to King John II of Portugal. He proposed that the king equip three sturdy ships and grant Columbus one year's time to sail out into the Atlantic, search for a western route to the Orient, and return. Columbus also requested he be made great admiral of the ocean, appointed governor of any and all lands he discovered, and given one-tenth of all revenue from those lands. The king submitted Columbus's proposal to his experts, who rejected it. It was their considered opinion that Columbus's estimation of a travel distance of 2,400 miles was, in fact, far too low. In 1488, Columbus appealed to the court of Portugal once again, and once again, John II invited him to an audience. That meeting also proved unsuccessful, in part because not long afterwards Bartolomeu Diaz returned to Portugal with news of his successful rounding of the southern tip of Africa. With an eastern sea route to Asia apparently at hand, King John was no longer interested in Columbus's far-fetched project. Columbus traveled from Portugal to both Genoa and Venice, but he received encouragement from neither. Columbus had also dispatched his brother Bartholomew to the court of Henry VII of England, to inquire whether the English crown might sponsor his expedition, but also without success. Columbus had sought an audience from the monarchs Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile, who had united several kingdoms in the Iberian Peninsula by marrying, and were ruling together. On 1 May 1486, permission having been granted, Columbus presented his plans to Queen Isabella, who, in turn, referred it to a committee. After the passing of much time, the savants of Spain, like their counterparts in Portugal, replied that Columbus had grossly underestimated the distance to Asia. They pronounced the idea impractical and advised their royal highnesses to pass on the proposed venture. However, to keep Columbus from taking his ideas elsewhere, and perhaps to keep their options open, the Catholic monarchs gave him an annual allowance of 12,000 Moravdison, in 1489, furnished him with a letter ordering all cities and towns under their domain to provide him food and lodging at no cost, agreement with the Spanish crown after continually lobbying at the Spanish court and two years of negotiations. He finally had success in January 1492. Ferdinand and Isabella had just conquered Granada, the last Muslim stronghold on the Iberian Peninsula, and they received Columbus in Diana Cordoba, in the Alcazar Castle. Isabella turned Columbus down on the advice of her confessor, and he was leaving town by mule in despair, when Ferdinand intervened. Isabella then sent a royal guard to fetch him, and Ferdinand later claimed credit for being the principal cause why those islands were discovered. In the April 1492 capitulations of Santa Fe, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella promised Columbus that if he succeeded, he would be given the rank of Admiral of the Ocean Sea and appointed Viceroy, and Governor of all the new lands he could claim for Spain. He had the right to nominate three persons, from whom the sovereigns would choose one for any office in the new lands. He would be entitled to 10% of all the revenues from the new lands in perpetuity. Additionally, he would also have the option of buying one-eighth interest in any commercial venture with the new lands and receive one-eighth of the profits. Columbus was later arrested in 1500 and dismissed from his posts. He and his sons, Diego and Fernando, then conducted a lengthy series of court cases against the Castilian crown, known as the Plaitas Columbinos, alleging that the crown had illegally reneged on its contractual obligations to Columbus and his heirs. 
the Columbus family had some success in their first litigation, as a judgment of 1511 confirmed Diego's position as viceroy, but reduced his powers. Diego resumed litigation in 1512, which lasted until 1536, and further disputes continued until 1790.